Uh, my name is Faustine Chan. I'm the business innovation manager for BBB. So we've been hosting um, daily webinars um, just for our businesses and also the business community just to give you resources, guidance, and education on things that um, you have questions on or hesitant um, to seek professionals. So um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and um, introduce our speaker for today. We have Alessandra Lazama. Um, she's an entrepreneur and PE-backed CEO, advocate for women pursuing careers in tech and other STEM fields. Um, she's an angel investor to San Diego-based early stage companies and founder and CEO of Tutris, um, which is an on-demand childcare technology platform that is reinventing how parents access and pay for affordable, high-quality childcare. She's also passionate about technology and has enjoyed illustrious career of taking underperforming tech companies and turning them into scalable, high-performing powerhouses. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Alessandra. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm super flattered with that introduction. I'll see if I can follow it with a uh, equally, uh, you know, impactful presentation here. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you to the Better Business Bureau for this opportunity to share this time with everyone. First and, and foremost, I, I want to thank you for spending the time with me here and uh, understanding that everyone is living a new reality. Uh, these are really trying times and I know everyone is doing their best to pivot and, and be creative and, and stay productive. So um, I'm going to do my best here to add value during the next hour or so. And I've always said that uh, the, the most productive webinars are those that have an active uh, Q&A session at the end. So uh, don't be shy. Uh, there's only great questions. And, and the more questions that uh, I'm able to address at the end of the session, I feel that is most productive to everyone that lends me uh, their ear. So uh, with that, thanks again for the invitation. I'm hoping to cover uh, three main points uh, during the presentation here today. And, and um, if I'm not uh, doing a great job at that, certainly the Q&A session uh, can help us do that. Um, Childcare is an issue that a lot of folks don't understand how it impacts the day-to-day economic development of our region, um, the uh, productivity of employers, and certainly uh, the best outcome for working families. And so um, in, that, in that vein, what we're hoping to explore here today are uh, the economic impacts of childcare um, within the US and our region specifically, and also how employers can engage to help maximize the productivity of employers while providing them with that work home balance. So um, a little bit about me, I'm a single mom, have been for the last 19 years. I have a 19 year old. Um, it has been trying times for me as a single mom to pursue a career in business. And um, I'm very lucky to be a resident of Southern California here in San Diego for 20 years and have led a number of different companies, always in technology. And I think that as an employer, I bring a, uh, you know, a, a unique perspective to the conversation of childcare in, in the business space, as well as a family, um, you know, member. So um, of relevance here, I feel that in my experience as a single mom, I could have not done it without childcare. I could have not pursued a career. I could have never escalated my ambitions uh, coming up the ropes uh, within corporate America and have achieved a level of uh, you know, C-level executive had I not had a very strong uh, network of support through the child care providers that I was able to lean on uh, through my times and especially when my, my child was young. So I'm hopeful that a lot of you can relate to that um, and uh, we'll kind of take it from there. So uh, the basic premise is childcare is crucial to our region's economic health and vitality. And I think this is 
a surprise to anybody. It certainly contributes significantly to our economic activity because it creates jobs. Uh, jobs uh, create income. Families do better with better income, higher income. Children develop better. And certainly there's those tax dollars, right, that, that help us provide for our communities and all the programs that we all benefit from. Um, particularly as it relates to the labor force, child care allows for better labor force participation because it would seem common sense, but a lot of folks and employers don't always think through these things that, hey, if my workforce doesn't have appropriate child care, well, then I don't have the same opportunity to work and develop professionally for all the same reasons that we're gonna to be touching on some of those specifics here coming up in the presentation. And certainly, and most importantly, childcare and early education programs are a critical investment in our current and future workforce, especially highlighting future workforce. That is these little youngsters, these zero to five, especially children that have so much to develop. We are responsible to place them in the best possible situation so that they can reap the benefits of their academic development and so they can develop into great contributors of our community and have great success as our uh, future workforce. So let's take a little look at child care, the child care industry and economic impact of this industry just to put things in perspective. In California alone, 1.6 million children are in paid child care. This by no means considers all those other children that are in family care or you know, friends or neighbors that I'm able to lean on and create a support network through. These are specifically those that are part of some formal program, either a center-based child care and early, or early education program, or a family care program, which are basically those in-home, uh, wonderful, small classroom programs that many stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home professionals launch within their home. 12.8 and change billion to the economic impact. And, and this is just California alone. So there's about a $48 billion impact nationwide. And of that, strictly employee compensations and sole proprietors make up for almost $3 billion of our state economy. So it's a significant industry and profession to be in that contributes, let alone the spillover, the $2 billion in spillover to other industries, greatly to our economy. From a jobs perspective and the impact of jobs within our economy, it's shy of 223,000 uh, plus about 60,000 other in spillover to other directly and indirectly related industries. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty important profession. It's a pretty important industry to the economic development of our region. From an employed or an employer standpoint, 200,000 people that are employed in San Diego today have children ranging in ages zero to five. And this is a critical component of the child care uh, lens because we know from many, many studies that children zero to five are developing 90% of their brain capabilities during that time frame. So quality early childhood becomes or uh, education becomes imperative to maximize the child's positioning as it relates to kindergarten readiness and their academic development in years to come. And when we look at the magnitude of people employed in San Diego with that group, right, in, in 
um, in the spectrum of child care services and the required infrastructure and programs to support that magnitude of children, we're going to dive into some of the challenges that we have as a region and some of the challenges that we face nationwide as it relates to creating more and better quality programs to support this requirement. So California spends about $4 billion in subsidized childcare and preschool, which again ranges zero to five. And even then, you'd be surprised to learn that is simply not enough. So childcare in San Diego is defined to be scarce because when we take a snapshot of the existing demand for zero to five care versus the availability of licensed childcare programs and slots as we refer to them, based on either center-based childcare programs and preschools and or in-home family childcare programs, the combination of the both simply don't fulfill the demand. We have 44% deficit in this category of zero to five um, child to provider which is a pretty deep you know, gap to fill. So 335,000 children with working parents and only 145,000 available licensed childcare spots in our region. I can share with you that although these, um, these uh, statistical numbers are focused on San Diego, this is, very much the same trend that we can follow throughout the state and throughout most of the major cities in the US. And so when we dive into really understanding how this impacts families and the workforce and employers and our economic development per region, we have to get to the root cause of why we have this deficit. And so what we come up with and we understand after many of the studies that have, that, that have uh, been conducted is that A, childcare is not, we don't have enough slots. In addition, it's inconvenient. 66% of San Diego families, for example, with young children live in these childcare deserts. And when we defined a childcare desert, we're referring to a geographic area that has a demand of three or more zero to five children that require early education slash or childcare to one slot. So those childcare deserts exist primarily in heavily dense business districts, like for example, in San Diego downtown, or La Jolla, or Kearney Mesa, where there's a high level or a high concentration of workforce, yet there aren't enough child care providers or child care programs, whether they be center-based or family or in-home based. So that's a biggie. The next factor is it's simply unaffordable. So 66% of families can spend over 40% or more, depending on how many children, zero to five, they have at one point in time. They can spend 40% of their income simply on childcare. This has been compared to, in many, many studies, to the cost of a college education. And 
while it's equally and or more, I would argue, important as it relates to the success of our children and their careers, uh, their academic careers and, and their best possible outcome as uh, young adults, the truth is that families are left to scramble because the median income in California is you know, north of 80,000, but doesn't reach $90,000 a year. And that's a problem. And we're gonna to touch on, on why that is a problem here. The next area of challenge is the quality of childcare. So primarily there are two types of childcare or formal licensed childcare type programs. One is very much school um, structured or like in a school structure, an infrastructure, a center base. Many of you will have seen or driven by or have had some experience with like a Bright Horizons or La Petite Academy or a Kinder Care or that, that type of facility or an in-home child care program, which is referred to as a family child care program, FCC. Well, we don't have, as a, as a region, nor do we have a standard that all licensed child care providers follow to ensure that there is a like um, curriculum based, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, learning through play and or, you know, Montessori based, or there's all these different early childhood philosophies, but a standardized program by which we measure the developmental milestones that every zero to five child needs to meet at their very own unique pace, very unique to their um, capabilities and their pace of learning, however, formalized and standardized so that we can measure the quality of care. And so that poses a, you know, a challenge to families when selecting a child care provider to incorporate their children in XYZ program. And so because the quality fluctuates, you'd obviously want to also understand that the cost of childcare is going to go hand in hand with that higher or lower level of quality, whereas it should not have that bearing. We should have levels of standard that every child could access regardless of whether they are attending a center-based program and or an in-home family program. So here's the breakdown of what that really looks like for an average family in San Diego to take this example, where the median income is 83,000 and change. And when we break down, a family budget and the primary expenses that any household has to spend and then we put in perspective how much of that they need to spend on child care then we very quickly understand that they run in deficit so there is a huge gap between what the median income family in san diego and, and throughout california makes versus how much they need to make in order to not only comfortably but just borderline afford their basic livelihood including zero to five child care it's a big jump it's a big gap so what options do families have well here's the thing so our federal, state, and local governments have subsidized programs, 
all sorts of flavors of subsidies and, and different organizations that truly step up to our community to help and to ensure or want to ensure that every zero to five child has access to quality childcare. However, there is simply not enough resources for all of the children that qualify, just qualify for any type of state subsidy. So there is a huge affordability chasm when it comes to applying for and being eligible for subsidy programs. But before I touch on that, let's just talk about those children that actually do qualify for some sort of subsidy. Those families, while they qualify given their income, their family income being under 68,000 a year, even as a qualifying family, the resources available from, from our state and our um, local programs are simply not enough to support that demand. So the big title here is eight out of nine children that are eligible for subsidized childcare did not receive those services. They, they got some portion of it, which is simply not enough to support the peace of mind that a working parent needs to focus, to be productive, and to pursue their professional development within their corporate and or you know, professional environments. And that's a huge problem to have. If we layer on top of that, the challenge of not having enough subsidy resources to support all of those families that do qualify, layering on top of that, families that are making anywhere north of 70,000 and up to about 107,000 in, in annual income simply do not qualify for any sort of subsidy. And that's how we, you know, it's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. That's how we get back to six more than 60 percent of families not being able to afford quality child care so what's the impact of that real easy people start dropping out of the workforce because as an employer for the last 20 years i can tell you and having ran companies as small as you know 20 people and as big as over 500 people here in san diego i can tell you my number one cost, human resource cost, was in the replacement of highly productive, highly qualified, highly valued employees when they left the workforce to have either their first or second baby. And we saw, unfortunately, that women are disproportionately affected in this realm for the obvious reasons. And it wasn't that they didn't wanna come back to work, and it wasn't that they weren't excited about their next step in their career. It certainly wasn't that they you know, loved uh, you know, their children to an extent where they didn't see themselves getting back into their career. It was simply because when they did the math and they figured out that it would almost cost them more money to come back into the workforce than not do anything at all and stay home and then realign their family budget and their family economics, they simply could not make a better decision than to drop out of the workforce. So sadly to say that employers are losing highly qualified, employees that contribute and have an impact across many different cross um you know cross disciplines within an organization because those those employees typically are contributors to different teams 
cross-functional goals and activities. And so it's like throwing a wrench into that productivity, productivity cycle that gets interrupted and we have to start all over again. One of the stats that really took me aback when I learned is that San Diego is the second lowest in the U.S. female participation as it relates to labor force in the U.S. That's, that's just astonishing. And part of the reason is cost of living in San Diego, as it is across all of California. But certainly cost of living coupled with cost of child care, quality child care, does not make for a good formula. So what do parents do? when they simply cannot sacrifice that second income because if we think about it, you know, it's, it's a catch 22. So you've got, in order to live quality of life in California, for the most part, you need dual income. Well, when you start a family, how ironic is it that when you start a family, your expenses go way up because here comes, you know, little baby Johnny and or little baby Mary, right? And so now I have increased expenses as a family, but yet because I cannot afford childcare, then one of the two parents typically drops out of the workforce to take care of, of the children. Eight out of 10 times it's, it's women that opt to stay home. And so now their family income drops and so their buying power is now less and so now instead of going out at for you know lunch or dinner over the weekend or you know buying shoes or going to the mall or you know uh just you know spending a reasonable amount of money in their quality of life now they're unable to do that because dropping out of the workforce has impacted their family economics to a degree where they have to start cutting back and sacrificing and conceding to a new level of life, which brings on a whole nother level of challenges with the family dynamic. And I can go on and on in that regard. It's, it's kind of like the snowball effect. I always talk about this big snowball effect. It impacts the economy, it impacts the employer, but more importantly, it impacts the family dynamic. And when it impacts the family dynamic, it ultimately seeps into our children and they are the future workforce and that nothing good comes from that. So what do parents do? They're settling for low quality care, which in turn is not good for children and is not good if we're thinking about the most vital of investments in our future workforce, which should be our children and in their most early years. So let's discuss how this dynamic impacts employers. We know that 57 billion in annual lost earnings, productivity, and revenues is a direct uh, issue tied to lack of child care. We know that, we've got the studies. So $50 billion in annual lost earnings and productivity across the board, that's huge. And granted, not all employees are willing or not all employees are making a conscious decision to drop out of the workforce or not come into work or be late for a meeting or simply walking out of a training course or a training session because they have to go pick up little Billy. It's not a conscious decision or a willing decision by employees, yet employers are seeing billions of dollars go down the drain in lost productivities and revenues due to this very direct challenge. Further, when employers lose a valuable employee, it costs them up to 200% or more of the original employee's wage simply to find a recruiter, get a lineup of uh, qualified candidates to vet and select, 
a candidate hire, train, ramp up, and wait until that newer um, employee reaches the levels of productivity, which he or she may or she or he may not. And then I have to start all over again. So this 200% spend uh, of employers is very relative because depending on how valuable and how seasoned and the level of contribution to the organization that the uh, lost employee had, it, this 200% can go up to 500%. And I know from personal experience and from seeing that and analyzing that and running all the KPIs in the companies that I've ran, that this is by far the single largest HR cost that any one of my organizations ever had. So raising awareness and educating employers and educating the C-suite at all different levels of um, employer groups is key because this is not an, a, a, you know, a topic that has been commonly um, ref, you know, commonly brought into the business communities and the business conversation until very recently. And it's because it has taken us decades to really understand the direct correlation between family peace of mind, quality childcare, and how that impacts our workforce that in turn impacts the outcome of employers. I've always said that extraordinary companies, those that succeed, that have the most recognition, are those that dedicate a great deal of time to understanding their workforce and creating the best culture so that employees can thrive personally, professionally, financially, but they can always have a goal setting um, mentality and program that as employers we're willing to uh, create and structure for them so that they are thriving consistently and growing. That propels the company forward so long as we are very diligent about keeping a culture of work home balance that can impact the productivity and in turn help employees as well as the employer reach their personal, professional and financial goals. So that's what brings me to work home balance. <laughs> so in short, from you know the perspective of all of the reports and analysis that, that have been conducted by eminence, you know, by universities, by subject matter experts, by, you know, early childhood, um, you know, gurus of gurus. The, the reality is, is that it's all grounded on a very simple fundamental, and that is work home balance starts with access to quality childcare. So I feel that with the effort of the economic development organizations, with the chambers, with you know, the Better Business Bureaus, with you know, some of our federal, state, and, and local government programs and initiatives, and, and percolating the discussion more and more about this, we're getting somewhere. We're starting to raise awareness and there's still a lot of work to be done. But in turn, we conducted a study through the San Diego Regional Chamber Foundation and found that in San Diego alone, 90% of employers actually understand that there, there needs to be programs that support their workforce to ensure that homework balance above and beyond what we have done in the past. It's, an, it's there are new times, Gen Ys, Gen Zs that are coming up, that are starting their families and will start their families, have a very unique perspective of work-home balance. And it starts with, am I doing okay at home? Are my kids going to be okay? And can I focus enough time 
to develop professionally, but just enough so I can thrive, so I can be happy, not only professionally and financially, but certainly personally. And I think that there's more and more awareness of that. And, and you know, webinars like these and, and forums like these give us more of, of an opportunity to have these discussions, which I'm very appreciative about. So 55% of, of the base also recognize that their workforce has not been able to work due to some kind of childcare related issue. So now it's not a mystery anymore. So when people are absent, when they call in sick, they may not be sick. They may have a sick child at home or um, they, their babysitter didn't show up or this or that, the other, right? And, and in conclusion, out of all the employers that were surveyed, at least 35% believe that they can step up they can take action and they can provide additional support that will definitely have a positive impact on their outcomes and being specific to talent acquisition, retention, and productivity. So these are some of the ways that employers are stepping up and helping. And, and these are just, you know, kind of the, the, the top of the, of the list. There's many other uh, ways in which employers are stepping up, but you know, an easy peasy one to help is, wow, if it costs the average family $17,000 in California to put an infant through quality childcare, $17,000 is a lot of money. So if as an employee, I can have a, um, you know, a flexible um, spending account, that's a huge ordeal for me, right? So that's one of the most significant um, kind of easy to implement, uh, little to no cost to employers that many of them are kind of thinking about so that at least employees are paying for uh, childcare costs pre-tax with their pre-tax money. But, you know, some of the, the very basics that are already happening is the flexible and predictable schedules. There's a lot of that going on, especially in, in you know, California and, and especially in the San Diego region. There's, you know, we're a hotbed for technology. So it's Northern California. So working from home, virtual offices, um, kind of what we're doing now through COVID-19, right? Um, this sort of thing, very important. So a number of different um, opportunities here. But more importantly is how do we help families afford it? And there's a number of programs out there, but in the end, as we've discussed, government is simply not enough. So employers will need to step up, do their math, crunch their numbers, and very quickly figure out that if they have to replace an $80,000 a year employee and it's gonna cost them 160,000, they could probably put $6,000 into an early childhood education fund for that family for the course of you know two three years or however they structure that save a bundle of money and truly help subsidize that family so that that employee can have peace of mind and come to work be consistent and and grow their their career there so let's talk a little bit about and i'm i'm uh trying to kind of rush through the the last few slides hopefully i'm not rushing too much uh just to stay on on time and on track here so we can have a good Q&A session. But so what does childcare look like during COVID-19? And um, I know for a fact that, you know, many of you on this call, if you don't have children, you know someone that has children or a relative, you know, a relative has children, everyone in, in the space was impacted. Children came home, schools are canceled, um, you know, parents are juggling the responsibilities of working from home, you know, being on Zoom meetings, children yelling in the back and homeschooling and lots of anxiety and, and lots of, of, of chaos, if you will, in the family dynamic because of it. Well, you know, with an optimistic view, we all know this will pass. And yes, they're very trying times. And I'm, you know, very um, proud of the community and of parents and in particular moms because everyone has stepped up to truly reinvent their family dynamics to incorporate the homeschooling, this and that and the other. But guess what? There's those essential 
uh, services workers that don't have that privilege of staying home. And so the virtue of the child care services structure is that although many of the schools closed and many of the center-based child care programs closed, this incredible network of family child care providers, which are the in-home programs, they stepped up they've remained open and they're servicing with all due priority the essential services um, folks that are out there being the heroes of every day going out to work the nurses the doctors you know the the telecommunications the the you know service providers like plumbers um, you know electricity all of those essential services are a priority um, as are the child care providers in and of themselves. So I think that through these times, what we have proven, um, as we had been discussing and, and as they were, uh, you know, percolating in the, in the conversation were these family oriented childcare programs. And, and through this crisis and through this situation, they have really proven the, the, you know, net worth to our communities in supporting a, you know, a most critical situation um, pretty much overnight, right? So they've extended uh, small centers that were typically licensed for six to eight children, have extended the groups uh, for up to 10 children in their homes. And so this has been an incredible level of support for all of the essential workers that are out in the field every day, making our lives whom are privileged to be working from home uh, better. So what is getting back to business and kickstarting our economy is going to look like um, after COVID-19? Like I said, we will get past this. We don't know what time frame that will look like, um, but we, were cert we will certainly get past it. And when we do, it's going to be a rat race. Everyone is going to be under the gun, employers, employees, everyone is going to be under a tremendous amount of pressure to ramp up and to get back to those levels of productivity and to catch up on all the opportunities lost during this crisis. And, and the reality is, is that although we are all talking about, you know, air quotes, getting back to normal, the truth is, the back to normal doesn't exist anymore because from you know this point forward and every day we're living a new reality and while we're going to get through these trying times the matter of fact is that back to normal doesn't exist it's going to be our new normal employees are going to face the challenges of resetting their lives back to getting themselves in the office. Many of them have lost their childcare providers for X or Y, Z reasons. We don't know when schools will open, maybe employers are gonna open before school. So there's going to be, and there still is a ton of uncertainties that employees will face and they will need to tackle and they will need to work through. And because we know that employers and organizations are nothing more than the wonderful people that come into work every day to make things happen. Well, if employees are facing challenges, well, what can we expect for employers, right? So it's all going to be a huge, um, you know, uh, kind of a huge initiative and everyone is going to be struggling to realign and to be creative as it relates to creating the new, new normal. And in doing that, more than ever, employees will require support of their employers, of the community, of their neighbors, of their family members, of the you know, network of providers, so that they're able to focus having the peace of mind that they have their children in a good place and that they can move on to help contribute towards the restructuring of the economy and kind of putting the building blocks back together um, as, we, as we need to. And from a perspective of employers, 
I feel that it's going to be critical that employers and HR groups and or C-suites and or managers really take the time to understand the impact to the workforce, meaning us, meaning the people, meaning you, meaning everyone, from a physical, psychological, and logistical standpoint, because this, you know, COVID-19, I, I feel um, in, in a very tragic way, an unexpected way, uh, I feel taught everyone an invaluable lesson as it relates to realigning priorities and truly appreciating what's important and and i feel that everyone is going to come out of this situation stronger better faster stronger but also with a very refreshed perspective of what's important to me what's important to my family and how i measure success and progress and i feel that employers should not ignore the small or micro level changes um, as they're reported and as they learn them because they can certainly have an outsized impact on the recovery of their business. So the bottom line, I'll wrap up with childcare supports the workforce and therefore employers. High quality childcare builds a strong future workforce for all the reasons that we've discussed and employers will play, do play, must play, and shall play an important role in supporting working families so that we can all get to our new normal, uh, kickstart the economy, and reap the benefits of moving forward as a community, moving forward as a state, moving forward as um, you know a country, and ultimately placing our children in the best possible place for their you know, productive future and so that they can become productive members of our community and successful in how they define success. And don't forget employers, your ROI. In doing all of this, you will reap the benefits of the highest possible ROI. So with that, 248, I'm sorry I went over three minutes, but thank you all for your attention and I open it up to the Q&A. Yes, thank you. Um, if you want to ask Alessandra any questions, please type them in the chat option and we can um, answer those or in the Q&A. Um, we did have some questions already popped up. Um, someone had asked that there was great information that you shared about um, San Diego and California impacting the workers and businesses for childcare. Do you have any statistics or a website that you can share um, for Arizona companies? You know, I, I and my staff shared that with me that I should have been a little broader in the staff. But absolutely, we have uh, very specific information to Arizona, and I'm happy to make that available through uh, through your um, your organization. And maybe you can broadcast it out, or um, I don't have it like off the top of my my mind here that I can shout it out, but I can certainly make it available. Yes. So we um, share the recap link for the webinar for all the attendees so we can definitely share that information if you forward it to me so we can forward it to I'm everybody I'm happy that's to do so um, so we have a question from um, Linda um, how can I educate my staff on child care options during this time well um, I have a, a last slide here which is not part of the presentation but um, or meaning I didn't want to talk to it but here it is so we we can provide um, you know, the, the, the Better Business Bureau so that you can distribute and, or include it in the link. Um, all of the resources that are available to employers as uh, resource, uh, resources to propagate through your uh, different groups of staff. Ultimately, na uh, you know, nationwide, there is the Child Care Referral Resource Network. And so every city has their uh, child care resource and referral office. In San Diego, it happens to be the YMCA. Um, you can always call them and they can, they can help guide you, but there's also you know, different organizations that provide all sorts of, of different support to TRIS. One of the, one of the core um, uh, you know, uh, value propositions that we bring 
uh, to the market and to employers is that at no cost to either providers, employers, or parents, we have an online real-time um, ecosystem of all of licensed childcare providers that either have availability or will have availability in, in the near future. So parents can sort through a database that they can query um, through a, you know, a geographic requirement or a budgetary requirement, or for example, a specific needs. Like there, we have children with nut allergies, for example, that are uh, very sensitive to the type of program that they can attend. So, um, you know, be, be, you know, be uh, obviously free to, to share tutris.com as a resource uh, at no cost, but there's a list of resources. This is in, embedded in the presentation um, and I can provide more, but know that no matter where you live, no matter what city, there is a childcare resource and referral office that can provide you with information. Great. So our next question comes from Mary. Um, I'm a small business owner and only have three employees. Um, is there a magic formula um, return on investment for businesses that are considering um, adding support for child care? Well, and that's a great uh, you know, concept and thought to have. There isn't a magic formula other than truly evaluating the net worth of the contribution of that employee to your business and analyzing your payroll cost with burden of that employee and then determining if you ever lost that employee how long do you think it would take you to replace and how long do you feel that it would take you to ramp up and get the productivity levels and once you come up with that number that's the magic number right there anything that you can contribute lesser than that is going to be a smart investment in in the initiative so you can come up with a lot of different ideas for example um, as a small employer, you can, um, you know, you can partner with a family child care network provider and you can come up with, you know, an enterprise and I say enterprise, even though you're a small business, but with a program where you say, well, I'll contribute X dollars on a flat fee per each one of my employee and I would like them to have access to your child care slot inventory is a priority. And, and you know, those sorts of um, partnerships happen on a proactive propositioning basis. They may not be formalized in the market, but if you are aware of a family network uh, uh, provider um, and or network, you can be creative and, and create that type of proposal for a partnership so that your three staff, uh, you know, maybe in the future to be five or 10 or however many, uh, have access to the childcare slots available in their network. Great, thank you. And then we have a question from Jackie. Um, as my state lifts up the lockdown, um, where do you suggest I go seek childcare from if my childcare center is not ready to be opened yet and I have to return to work immediately? I cannot stress enough the important role that family childcare providers um, have during the COVID-19 lockdown and the role that they're going to have as we're coming out of it. I think this question really hits the nail on the head. I feel employers are going to be ready to return to full action sooner than the school system will and that most center-based care facilities will or uh, child care facilities will. And so I feel that this is an incredible opportunity uh, for families to search family child care programs and, and build a relationship and understand the virtue and the value of smaller classroom settings that are of great value to children and have been proven to be very productive in, in how children learn. Actually, children tend to learn better in smaller groups. 
Um, and we're happy to be a resource. Again, there is no cost to parents and or providers in any way for us to help them connect. If, if you'd like to um, you know, go to tutris.com and, and send us a request, we're happy to help you make that connection. Um, looks like we have a qu question from Chris. Um, as summer approaches, is there anything that I should look at when it comes to summer camps and child care facilities um, because we're dealing with the after effect of the COVID-19? Well, um, you know, I think that most of the criteria that we've been applying during the COVID-19 lockdown is, is going to be part of our new normal, whereby asking questions or is, is always uh, kind of, you know, in the safety zone. So I would definitely inquire about the, um, you know, the, the, the program discipline for uh, safeguarding children's health, uh, the staff's health, um, you know, what new protocols they have in place to ensure that um, their, uh, you know, their facility uh, meets with uh, the best, you know, hygiene requirements, uh, what new protocols and, and processes and workflows they put in place and incorporated into their program so the children are more aware of, you know, washing their hands more often, you know, where are they eating, how are they eating, uh, you know, what, how, how they're uh, incorporating, um, the you know curriculums and the games to ensure that um, the children can be spaced out a little more than they were in the old normal now in this new normal so just just asking the questions and I would not expect that a lot of the disciplines and protocols that we have had uh, to impose and and learn and and practice and adopt during the COVID lockdown I I would assume and and want to uh, you know hopefully. Uh, learn that we are upkeeping through, you know, uh, through the certainly during the summer and, and coming out of it because this is not something that has a dead stop or a dead end, right? After summer, uh, we're still going to be dealing to some extent with COVID 19 for, for a little while. So I would just ask a lot of questions. Great. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, I don't see any final questions. Um, Wonderful. If you, do, if you do have any, um, we'll give it another minute um, to type them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, thank you again so much, Alessandra, um, for taking time out of your busy day to present us um, and giving us this information. It's very helpful and useful for all of our business owners out there, um, also employees of businesses that are listening in today. Um, all of this information is going to be posted along with past webinars um, on events.bbcommunity.org. And once again, we're holding these webinars daily, so I hope you tune in and sign up for them. Um, you just go to events.bbcommunity.org to sign up for them. Um, I'll do one final quick through to make sure there's no more questions. But again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for Alexandra for um, taking time of your busy day. Um, if you have any questions or follow up, you can always email me as well. And please stay safe out there and be healthy. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the Better Business Bureau as well. Thank you for the invitation. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy, stay optimistic, stay well. <laughs>